Okay, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Gary Matsuoka, and this is uh, Laguna Hills Nursery in Santa Ana, and this morning's class is on a couple of the Mediterranean fruits, figs and pomegranates. So we'll start, we'll do it alphabetically, so we'll start with the figs. Um, figs have become one of our more important fruits the last few years because it is one of those trees that produces immediately, seems to produce immediately, and it, and it can take, you can get good fruit in a small area, plus they don't all ripen at once. So that's the good thing about it. Now they originated, are thought to have originated in Western Asia. Um, they are in the same family as the other ficuses, so fiddly fig, very popular indoor plant. Um, according to what we've read is that all these, all the ficus member families have fruit that you can eat. Although I would say probably not, you know, as long as you're not squeamish because a lot of them have worms in them. <laughs> and uh, a lot of the, quote, figs that these trees make are wasp pollinated. So there might be little tiny gnat sized wasps and their larvae inside the fruit. But, well, we're talking about these today. <laughs> That's something else. So anyway, so figs uh, thought to have, have evolved in Western Asia, and they have records going back at least 5,000 years of man cultivating them. So people actually knew how to grow this, these trees from a long time ago, way back, 3,000 BC or whatever that comes to now. Uh, and they took the trees with them and replanted them. Um, so a lot of the varieties are extremely old of the fig trees. Now we just started doing a lot of collections. So on the list we gave you, uh, that's what we had earlier this year is about 30 uh, cultivars, 30 different genetic, genetically different varieties. And we're just getting started on this because there aren't any, there aren't very many official quote, official sources of these trees. A lot of these are coming from private collectors. So we don't, we're still trying to figure out who's got what, what's the right name for these figs, uh, if we have the right ones. And this year, we're, I would say we're going to toss out three that we sold and not sell them as that plant anymore, like black Madeira, white Madeira. And uh, even last year, we, we stopped selling black Ischia because we knew it wasn't right because the fruit wasn't totally black on that one. Uh, we think we, you know, so every year we're, uh, we're asking other collectors to give us their, their samples of their plants to try out, and we'll see if we can get this straight. Um, so we're doing as good as we can. So we don't try to gouge people with prices. You know, you look on uh, the Internet and see the prices that they're selling these uh, rare varieties for, and it's incredible. Plus, uh, be careful on the internet too, because a lot of these things are coming from places that aren't supposed to be shipping to California. We had an instance of one customer telling us that the ag department came and confiscated a lot of the stuff he had just bought on, on the internet, saying it was uh, not should not be in California. So uh, there are those too. So anyway, the figs, um, the way we propagate them. You know, you can grow them from seed. There's certainly a lot of volunteers in everybody's yards coming up along walls where the birds, uh, you know, kind of scrape the seeds off their beaks and the seeds fall on the ground or it's in their excrement and falls on the ground and starts growing trees. Uh, when you grow a fig from a seed, usually, well, there's three possibilities you can get. There's, you can get the regular female. So all the figs that we sell are well, no, except for one, are self-fertile females. They don't need to be pollinated. They make fruit all by themselves, no help needed. So the majority of figs are that one. Uh, you can also get um, a fig that has male and female parts in it, and those are called the capra figs or goat figs because only the goats will eat them. They're full of feathery anth anthers and filaments where the pollen is. So half of them, like I've, I've grown quite a few figs from seed 
and about half are female and about half are the capra figs and you can't eat those so you waste a lot of time because it can take up to seven eight years for a seedling fig to make fruit and if only half of them are decent and again half of those are not very good so uh, that's still interesting though that's still how most figs were developed or things that just grew and people like them and they chose them and um, so that's still the way we do it find new things anyway now so we start figs from cuttings so come winter you can take almost any fig plant like this is a real nice specimen here and take a piece of stem each leaf is attached at one spot and that's called a node and if you take a stem that grew this year that has at least two nodes on it you know in winter time the leaves will fall off turn yellow and fall off and you can cut this stem like this and stick it in the ground and it usually grows three nodes is better two nodes can work one node can even work if you stick that part in the dirt so that's how we grow figs so it's quite easy to grow new ones especially if you have nice thick stems like this I mean if you use a real skinny stem it may not work and we know a lot of the stuff being sold on the internet they sell stems and you get stuff this thick you know the chances are not that good if you've got a stem this thick which is about uh, that's a good half inch to five eighths inch caliper there uh, that's definitely going to grow that's it's got a lot more strength in it so this particular plant here was started from a cutting in probably in January and uh, actually this one looks like it might be last year's tree so this was started uh, a year and a half ago from a cutting so last year was about a foot tall and this year it grew from this point all the way up to here so it's grown about six feet or so this year and there's fruit forming on it figs have two crops um, so you can look at this tree this tree has got this is a two-year-old tree here started from a cut this is last year's wood this is this year's wood so figs can develop two crops uh, one would be figs from that are in last year's wood so if the fig developed on this part here which is on its second year now that would be the spring crop and then everything and it would already be ripe and already be gone uh, on the new growth that comes out of this this year starting at a certain point of the year every leaf seems to make, be making a fig on at the base of it and that's the regular crop the summer fall crop they usually call it the fall crop but it starts late summer and goes on sometimes into winter so and then the very last part little figs that are at the last leaves on this branch that never have a chance to develop that'll be next spring's crop now we've we have a customer who lives half the year in the Philippines and half the year around the block from us and he's taken our fig trees about this big to the Philippines and he says there they don't have a winter you know I think the coals he gets in the Philippines may be in the high 50s he said the trees fruit year-round now the problem with the Philippines is the monsoonal rain so the problem with figs is they don't like wet leaves so they're you know they like this Mediterranean or dry summer climate that we have because if they get rain on the leaves they get these diseases going on so the spotting on this leaf would be a, a, a leaf spot disease either fungus or bacterial <clears throat> this is probably a bacterial leaf spot and he says in the Philippines they can rain for three months straight and he loses all his fig trees so he comes and buys more so if they have a real bad monsoonal season it'll kill these things they can't take that jungle constant wet uh, and every time we get a rainstorm here yeah the leaves get spotty a lot of them fall off but then we have several more months of dry weather they just grow back and they're fine again so so we you know we you can treat for the diseases but we just don't bother it's we just don't have that much summer rain if you're in you know Texas or east of the Rockies 
Yeah, they, they have to have special figs back there that can handle the wet. We can grow any fig here, especially if you're in uh, the Central Valley, California, where it's 95 degrees all, every day in the summer. Figs love that. That's, that's their climate. Here we're close to the ocean. Some of the figs have trouble ripening when we have uh, a couple weeks of overcast weather. Most of them are fine. I mean, there's a few that we have to watch out for. So, so this is one of this is this year's cutting. We started this one um, probably in January, and it's grown that much. Now, the thing about figs is, um, like, this is root bound. This is definitely root bound. They're, they root really quickly. In just a few months in that pot, you know, half year in a pot, it's it just got no place to go. So we, then we put them into our bigger pots, and uh, this was moved from a container like that to this container. Date. So usually this is about two months from there to here. So it may have been about this size when we put it in, and it just, you give them a little bit of room, they really take off. Yes? Uh, what's the best way to loosen up the root down this? Uh, we could just put it in there and put the dirt over it? Uh, yeah, we don't, this, this doesn't bother me at all. The fact that the roots are going in circles doesn't bother me. If it was a eucalyptus tree or something that's supposed to grow 100 feet, it would bother me because that's structurally not as strong as the roots going straight out. But I don't want this fig to grow 100 feet or anything approaching that, so I don't care if the roots are in circles. It's not that big a deal. Plus, we haven't seen figs fall over for that reason. But yeah, if you've got a shade tree that's supposed to grow 50 foot, 60 foot, you don't want circling roots in the pot. But yeah, this, this is fine. I don't, it doesn't bother me. Yes? Well, it uh, depends how many figs you want. So whether or not you want them in a bigger pot, like a lot of people, if you're in New York and you have an apartment and you're growing figs in there, this may be as big as you want. This tree can probably do uh, 20 figs a year off of this, maybe 25 figs a year, and that may be fine. Um, if you want, say, 30 or 40, go into a container about like this. If you want 100 or more, put them in a 24-inch box like that. If you want to, you know, if you want lots of them, you put them in the ground. So the most figs will grow between 10 and 20 feet without pruning. Um, now, generally, you know, you you got to reach your figs to pick them, so we don't want them to get that big. So the I the key to figs is the winter pruning. So we usually prune in winter because they're not making fruit at that time. The way we prune them, now some, there are some figs that, you know, if, th if this was winter on this fig, I wouldn't prune it. It's just so short, you don't need to prune this thing. And then all the little figs at the very tip that are uh, undeveloped will make a good spring crop. But if this was, you know, like this one, let's do this one instead. So this one, See, it started here this year, and it's grown this much. You can cut it down to the last, very last leaf where the last leaf was. So that's this year's growth, where this leaf is. And the new growth that comes out at, at the node of this leaf will then have another branch just like this with fruit on it. Now, most people say, well, let's just do two nodes. So they'll, they'll cut it down to here, and then you'll get two branches with figs on them that grow just like this one, or maybe not quite as much because this is, and if you have two branches, they'll kind of share the strength, and they'll be easier to pick. So every winter, if you don't want the tree to be too tall and too high to reach, so you'll see pictures of fig orchards in the wintertime where they've got the...
about eight foot. It's a little room, and it has netting over it. And Skin cracks. It doesn't split open, but it cracks like this. And then you know it's, wow, that's okay. as good as you can get. Um, some figs split pretty easily. Most of the splitting is due to moisture irregularities. Like brown turkey, if you got a brown turkey, a blackjack, some of the bigger, wide, bell shaped figs, um, if they go wet, dry, wet, dry, during the day from watering and then it dries up, then they tend to split open, which is not, not too good because then bugs start getting in. Sometimes the bugs leave it alone. How come the fig is that yellow? Um, we'll thing. talk about that too. So it doesn't matter the color. You're looking more at the shape and that will determine that it's really yeah. thick. Well, you look for the skin. The skin getting the crack lines on it, that's, that's like the best way to tell. It's not the color. It's not always the color. But when they develop those crack lines, they're pretty good. Some pigs have such a short neck, you can't, you know, you can't just lean down or anything. Is there something that you could pick before it's ripe and have it ripen? No. Not too well. I mean, you can pick them one day before, let them sit around, and they might turn okay. But most of them get much sweeter if you pick them the day they're ripe. Okay. So. Usually they are hot, and if they are giving soft, does that mean it's ripening? Yeah, but I still softness, sometimes they're still, sometimes that can be dryness too. But if I just pick them when they're soft, they're still kind of latexy. I mean, the thing about figs is when they're not ripe yet, the fruit is full of latex, which is the same thing that's mm -hmm. in the sap and all that. It's this milky thing. And if you eat a fig that's not real ripe on your lips, they start to buzz. You get that latex reaction. So, you know, they said if you're eating a lot of figs, if you just eat one or two a day, it's not a big deal. But if you're eating like five or ten figs a day, uh, a lot of the people who like figs don't eat the skin. Because the skin does have a little bit of latex, and by the you know, seventh or eighth fig, your lips are buzzing because of that. Okay, let's see. So the main fig varieties, the most figs, you know, they ripen about the same time. There's a few figs that are different than the others, but most figs ripen about the same time. I think there's anything else in this. Oh, a few other notes. Um, most figs that are sold have a virus in them. Um, fig viruses are spread by little tiny mites. It's hard to stop it. So we, even though the they know, the growers know they, that it is possible to get the viruses out of the fig trees. Like most roses we used to sell had viruses in them. Uh, and most of them were cleaned up, although recently I see you know, some of the growers are getting lazy. And, but rose viruses are real hard to transmit. Fig viruses, on the other hand, there's a microscopic mite that can transfer it. So most people don't bother to try to control it. So the fig viruses show up usually in the spring when it's still kind of cool. Viruses hate heat, so by summertime, you will not see viruses on any fig, unless they're in real poor condition. You won't notice the viruses. So the way viruses show up on figs, usually the leaves are kind of a mottled color, like this small one here. So this came out earlier this year. So the majority of figs have viruses in them, and the majority of them, you won't see any sign of it once we get to summer. We've seen a lot of uh, complaints on the internet about certain growers having virus-infected figs, poor quality, they said. 
Uh, it's not the case. Uh, almost everything has been around long enough to pick up viruses. So we just don't worry about those. And if the leaves turn yellow or like brown and falls off, does that mean you don't have a lot of water? Um, so on figs, if the ground is too wet, the leaves droop. If it's too dry, they get brown edges. Mine turns yellow, I can't fall down. Um, that could be bad soil. Well, a little bit like some of those, but they turn completely yellow, I can't fall down. Yeah, it could be lack of water, too. A lot of plants can respond for lack of uh, shock, lack of water, not enough water to drop some of the older leaves. It can be the newer leaves. Sometimes it's the older leaves that they drop it. But bad soil, you know, if you have <coughs> wood-based soil that you're growing it in, then we see a lot of yellowing because the roots, the roots don't develop well on wood-based soils. And because of that, the plant's always lacking fertilizer. So it's sacrificed, you know, the old leaves are turning yellow so the nutrients from those leaves can be transmitted to the new leaves. So they sacrifice the old to, to grow new. It's in the ground, so what can you do? Fertilize more. Fertilize. But hopefully it was prepared right. How old is that tree that's doing this? It's about a few years old. But when I bought it, it's a, it's a tree. And then it has all the branches in the side. So it's already pretty big it's when you got it? It's already, yeah, tall, you know. Yeah. So if you bought a big tree, it probably had a lot of wood around it. So it's still being affected by that. Sometimes the wood and the soil affect them for up to 10 years. And then it kind of disappears probably just bad roots that aren't as good as they could be, but I wouldn't worry about it too much. The tree will outgrow it. What can you do about scale? Sometimes they get scale on bugs and stuff. Well, scale, uh, yeah, the scale insects, which are like bumps on the branches, usually the ants bring those, so control your ants. We have some good ant base, and then spray the tree with an oil spray. I mean, the industry knows that a lot of the scale is becoming immune to that the oil sprays, where they used to be, you spray with, with an oil, horticultural oil and the scale will just suffocate and die. So they must have evolved periscopes or something, or uh, excuse me, snorkels. Is there, it's not killing them as bad, so some of the scales that survive the oil must have some kind of mechanism where they can breathe through the oil. So. Okay, uh, let's go over the varieties. Can you talk, before that, could you talk about the amount of sun, full sun? Well, we've grown figs anywhere from full sun to full shade. Oh. Mm -hmm. They'll develop plenty of fruit in the shade. Okay. Just no taste at all. <laughs> they look nice. So, now, they won't do it inside unless you have a really, really bright room, but yeah, we grew them in the shade just to see what they would happen, and they had plenty of fruit, uh, normal size, no taste. So, you know, in my own house, the best we can do is like half a day of sun, mm -hmm. yeah. and the fruit was okay, but in our growing grounds and full day sun, boy, that fruit is a lot better. Yeah. It's much stronger flavored, more, more acid, more sugar, all that. So the best quality fruit's in full sun, but you can get by with about it. I would say even a third of a day you can get by with. Yeah. But uh, the quality is better with full sun. And soils not easy, they'll, they'll do well in harsh, harsh books. Yes, uh, they adapt to the society that we have. Okay, well the original variety in Southern California Black Mission Fig. It was brought from, I guess, Spain with the emissions. And that's still, now we haven't, I don't know if I have any left this year. We haven't really grown that many Black Mission because it's so common out there, but it's a small to medium, although the spring crop can be large, fig with dark skin, real dark skin and red flesh. 
It is considered one of the berry flavored figs, so some figs taste <coughs> very much like raspberries, blackberries, and the black mission would be one of the berry flavored figs. So it's actually shaped a little more like that. And that, that is one of the best producing trees around, but um, what we do is instead of the black mission, we've been selling more of one called Violet de Bordeaux. which we can't tell apart from Black Mission except it grows like six feet. So Black Mission can grow 20 feet plus and Bois de Bordeaux maybe six feet plus. And besides that, the fruit looks very much similar, the leaves look similar. Uh, it could be that Bois de Bordeaux is a Black Mission that has a certain virus that keeps it short. <laughs> We're not sure, but they look very identical. Now, both Black Mission and Violet de Bordeaux, we've seen them, like when we had those warm winters, 2013, 2014, 2015, these things didn't stop fruiting. They grew year round. They held their leaves and grew year round. Now, we're, we seem to be going back into cooler winters, but they'll probably drop and have just a spring crop and a, and a normal crop again. But uh, those have been producing a lot. Um, so, those are two figs that are very similar. Uh, now, brown turkey, we have, I don't think we have a single brown turkey because that one's real common too. But that would be a totally different fruit, more wide, real juicy. That, now, the Black Mission Vaz and Bordeaux are kind of firm, uh, firm fruit. They never crack, they never split. Brown turkey splits real easy. It's very juicy, very sweet, not as strongly flavored. Um, now we have out there, so the books, the literature says, you know, this is 20 years ago when they didn't know as much, that brown turkey, blackjack, uh, town emmerbearing, and a few others may all be the same exact fig. Well, you know, they brought, what they did is they went to Italy and made a collection of all the figs from Italy, and brought back 500 of them, and they're all so similar, they just put numbers on them, so. Uh, they're all, quite similar figs, and uh, no one knows which is genetically identical to the other, so they're, they're, it'll probably take them, you know, if anybody wants to, years and years to genetically prove that some of these are different. But brown turkey, uh, Italian and Everbearing, these seem to be smaller trees on top of that. So brown turkey, you know, say eight to ten feet. Uh, same with the rest. Blackjack, when we drew that one, it was like four foot. They're all fairly short trees with real big fruit that, that do tend to split, but they're real juicy and sweet. Um, I-258, which is one of the ones from Italy, number 258 from Italy. That one seems to be a lot of people's favorite. And that's one we'll probably, of this group, that's probably the one we'll propagate the most because we do like that one. Very sweet, very nice flavor on that one. And then we also think that the one called uh, one of the favorite figs of England, which came from across the channel, it also seems to be very similar to this group. And that one we like a lot too. These two tend not to split of this group. These two tend not but they're all real nice, sweet, wide, you know, bell-shaped or you know, little flat figs, fairly large. And the trees don't seem to grow that big.
Yeah, well, okay, and in pots, they eventually get really root bound. So you can say in a pot, whatever size you keep it, they're probably good for about five years. And then it's probably better to start a new plant from a cutting and just replace it every five, six years. I mean, a bigger pot, you can get longer, but uh, we know in the small pots, they get root bound very quickly. I mean, one gallon, I would say, uh, you gotta get it out of there within the year, it's too small. In the ground, how long will it? Don't know. I, I don't think I'll ever outlive a pig. Um, the rule about plants in the ground is that they can they can stay alive as long as they can support a bigger root system every year. So the what plants do is they poison the ground around them with old roots. They got to keep growing bigger. As long as they keep growing bigger, they can stay alive and healthy. And once they cannot, no longer have any more virgin soil to get into, then they kind of die really fast. So, uh, but I don't know, I think pigs can probably last hundreds of years. A lot of food trees are more productive when they're young. Like they said, the next one, pomegranates, they have some 500 year old pomegranate trees, but they're most productive in their first 50 years. So, yeah. It would seem to me, uh, I think they use a lot of water. They just have the ability to gather it up. Like mulberry trees, you put them in a pot, they wilt really fast because they got no place to grow their roots. But in the ground, they grow a tremendous root system. And I think the root system can really suck good on the ground, get all the water out of it. In a pot, there's just nothing to do. So you have to water them in a pot. I mean, they drop fast. time frame that you're going to grow them, we haven't seen any damage, but I'm sure within 40, 50 years, they can probably start lifting the ground, okay. just from the volume of roots. But uh, yeah, we haven't seen damage from the, from, the, from the eating pigs, but then I haven't seen, you know, I haven't been around a real old one. I do know, though, around a real old fig tree, the ground starts to rise. Yeah, because ficus is a real big Right, ficus is, yeah, any ficus within 20 years, most of the ornamental ficus trees cause root problems. Big since we're pruning them, that probably helps to slow it down. How far would the roots go? As far as the tree can grow. They say most plants will grow roots three to 20 times wider than the tree is tall. Like the tree is tall. Well, you don't really want to stop it from growing that high. That's how it stays healthy. Okay, on the white figs, <coughs> we used to sell white in Genoa, but we don't do that anymore. A lot of nurseries still sell white Genoa. The problem with white Genoa, so figs have an eye at the bottom, and on the, well, I should go back and talk about that. So on figs, the, the ones we're selling, they don't need an open eye because they don't get pollinated. So this one's got a real, you can't even hardly see any opening here on this fig. This is a real tight or closed eye on this one, so nothing gets into it. Um, there are figs like the Calamerna, also known as the Smyrna fig, that's real famous. If you go to Trader Joe's and you buy the dried figs, a lot of those are Smyrna figs or Calamerna figs. The Smyrna's grown in California. so the, Smyrna figs are the most famous figs in the world because the seeds have this nice crunch to them. They've got almost like a nutty flavor to them. And they are wasp pollinated. And for that, the Smyrna figs, which are in the white fig category, so it is appropriate, but they have to have two orchards. One orchard grows the trees to grow the figs. The other orchard they use to grow the wasps. So those figs have wasps in them. So what they do is on the when the when it's when the calamara figs are ready to be pollinated, they pick 
the wasps, the pigs from the other orchard. And what happens is the males are flying out of the little hole at the bottom looking for females to pollinate. Well, they're taking the pollen from the flowers that they're emerging from and, and looking for females to pollinate. Well, the calamernas, there's no females in there. So the figs fly in looking for the females or pollinating the calamerna figs and they don't find anything, so they're, that's it. There's no uh, wasps inside the calamernas, but they get pollinated by the wasps. So, uh, so they have, to have two orchards for that. And they, they say that each Calamer, uh, Smyrna fig tree needs about eight figs full of wasps. They said that they, uh, I'm never gonna look, but they said in some of the Smyrna figs you'll find little wasp parts that get stuck in there. Mm. A little bit of protein in your Smyrna <laughs> So anyway, that's the other type of fig. The Smyrna figs need to be pollinated. The figs we're carrying for the most part do not. Um, and, they, and you don't want that open eye. The open eye on the white genoa, if you have real high humidity, like we have foggy summer, um, this gets moldy. The whole thing starts dripping ooze and smells like smell fermenting. So you can lose, so after a couple years of losing all the white genoas on our tree, the fruit, inside out, it's not sure this story anymore, it gets moldy. So, but we don't like the big open eye, we'd rather have a tide eye in this area because we're close to the ocean. If you're in Fresno, you don't worry about an open eye. Uh, it's too dry there. But we don't do the white genoas. Um, but there are quite a few other white figs that are good. Uh, the top one that we're doing now is the sequoia. These are called the, the light colors. It's not necessarily white, but sequoia, which the University of California worked on for, I think they worked on it for like 40 or 50 years it. So they wanted to get something that would take the place of a Smyrna fig that did not need the, the other orchard to pollinate. So the nice thing about Smyrna, big fruit, dries light colored, it's got seeds in it that make a crunchy noise even though they're soft, they still crunch. And it's got that nice flavor. Well the sequoia um, developed, they finally got that down. Well there's two of them that they worked on, sequoia and sienna. Uh, excuse me, Sierra. Sequoia is the one they recommend for homeowners because it's a smaller tree. So that one, uh, the fruit is large. And I would say it's shaped about like this. This is not a sequoia, but it's it's got a similar shape. Uh, it's very light colored, you know, real pale yellow. The seeds in it have this nice rice crispy crunch to them. They're very sweet. A lot of people like the sequoia. I like the for a lot, and the tree's not too big. And it's got a closed eye. The Sequoia Sierra I haven't grown. Uh, that's supposed to be for orchards only in the Central Valley. That's kind of like their, their, their. When is the Sequoia fruit considered ripe? Is it cracked? It cracks. And, it gets and, cracked lines in it. Okay. Yeah, it has a real short neck, so it's hard to tell. Now, there's this thing called the yellow long neck, which happens to be this tree. And this is a fruit off the yellow long neck. Now, this is the midsummer fruit. Uh, earlier this year, the fruit was huge. I would tell you tennis ball size wow. fruit with the long neck. A very impressive plant. It does have its problems. It doesn't like overcast weather. If it, we have a week of overcast weather, you just throw that batch that's ripening away. It just doesn't taste that good. But this, you know, with the nice heat wave we just had, this should be excellent. Uh, so it is a very impressive tree, very impressive fruit, but I would say not for the coast. So stay off the coast with this one, and it's quite, quite good. This was found, bred, probably found at Quail Gardens down in Minnesota. But become famous around the world for its impressive size. It's got the nice size. So that's the yellow long neck. Um, another one I really like is Mary Lane. <coughs> you can call it Mary Lane C, but this got C. So this is Mary Lane. No, it's not. I have some Mary Lanes out there. 
but uh, it's a very uh, chartreuse colored fig, kind of a nice bright color, a very sweet mild fruit. I believe it does have an open eye. You know, this would be the first crop we've had since the 1980s. So one of our customers from back then um, got me a cutting from their tree, so we finally got it back. But a very good flavor one, but the open eye may be a problem on this one. But I like the flavor a lot, so we'll grow it for a while and see. Um, I think we have Tina out there, which is another in this line. I haven't eaten Tina, so I don't know it that well. Now, when they were developing Sequoia, uh, this happened. So this is Flanders, which in the 1980s, we got it from uh, the growers and the University of California just said, this is not what we want for the farmers, but it's so good we had to release it. So Flanders, You can see the shape of it here. It's kind of teardrop shaped fruit. Mostly green with some, uh, some purple veining, light purple veining on it. But uh, it's, it is one of the berry flavored figs. So we're brilliant red flesh, real strong berry flavor. Um, and, you know, 30 years ago, I told you Flanders best fig I've ever eaten. Now we have so many figs, it's, I would say Flanders is, you know, near the top, but not. Maybe not the top one anymore, but Flanders is awful good. In fact, uh, in the 1980s, one of our neighbors at, from our old store, Antonio from Genoa, Italy, he had uh, brought figs from his hometown in Genoa, Italy, and he had a collection of about 40 figs. We let him eat some of our Flanders, and he looked at him and he said, this is better than anything I've got in my yard. <laughs> so he was quite impressed with Flanders too. So Flanders is still considered one of the top figs out there. Uh, no faults, a closed eye, doesn't split easily, uh, holds well on the tree, it'll dry on the tree if you leave it. Uh, you know, the green figs and the yellow figs have an advantage in that the beetles don't notice them as well. They still will if you let them totally ripe and, and start rotting on the tree. But generally, uh, they're looking for the purple figs, so they don't see these as easily. It says here that the, that, that Flanders is a typical full-size tree. How big is that? It can grow 20 feet. 20 feet, but you can get a bit smaller. Oh yeah, I used to cut mine. You want to keep it with a picking height, so just keep it cut. But Flanders is a full-size. If you have a full-size, if you have a, a big tree already, how much can you cut back with a chainsaw pruning? Well, I mean, and once it's too big, you can cut it down to a stump. You're just going to lose one year of crop. And then regrow. Uh, I don't know that they're as sensitive to pruning as, you know, like if you did that to a peach tree, cut an old peach tree down to a stump, it'll kill it. They don't seal their wound very well. Figs are, I haven't heard that they're sensitive to all the pruning. So you'll, it won't prune for a year. Now, occasionally, fig trees will produce off of third year wood and second year wood rather than just our, you know, older wood than normal. But generally, we like to be, you know, keep the previous year's wood for two hours. But we have seen, I've taken cuttings from older wood and seen those produce for the first year. So it can, it can happen. Anyway, Flanders is good. Um, there's so many new ones, it's, it's getting a little crazy. Well, not necessarily new, just from, you know, just acquiring them from around the world. I'm trying to see if there's anything else light colored here that's famous. Um, I may have some white Marseille out there. How do you spell Marseille? <laughs> so, it, it, it's probably its only claim our only interest is that Thomas Jefferson brought it from France to Virginia. So it is one that handles the heat and humidity of Virginia well. So it's probably the leaves are more uh, resistant to fungus. And it probably has a closed eye, but I haven't eaten that one yet. We just got, I got the plants last year uh, and are growing them now. We'll see what 
it down with like it's a white fig or light colored fig also. This is one at my house called Smith's Fig. So the description here, very large flat fruit, yellow skin, amber and red flesh, very sweet flavor from Louisiana. So this one has a fairly small eyes, it won't get moldy. Uh, Louisiana, you gotta be able to handle the rain down there. So this is pretty good. This is actually pretty good. Well, my I've been eating these. Me some of the she has a few hundred. Mm -hmm. like, the pros are not eating at it. So anyway, uh, Smith's Fig has turned out pretty good. Those are most of the white things. For cooking with, is there any particular fig that's better than another? That I don't know. Um, that Italian guy that uh, used to be my neighbor, our, our store's neighbor, in fact, he used to make all kinds of stuff with his figs, but I'm not sure which one he was using. Somebody brought in fig cookies here that I tried, and they were amazing. I'd love to ask him which one he had. Okay, some of the top-rated figs. So supposedly the top-rated fig of the world is Black Madeira. Um, the Black Madeira we're selling, we don't think it's the right one. So we're getting fruit. Well, this is not black Madeira, but we're getting fruit a little bigger than this, uh, like this. And I think black Madeira is bigger than this, so we don't think what we sold was proper. Still really good fruit. A lot of the small figs are really, really tasty because everything's concentrated. But we don't think it's the right one. So I've got four or five new black Madeiras. We'll see what, what fruit they make and choose the nicest one and propagate from that one. We don't think what we we're selling is Black Madeira is Black Madeira. There's another one that's supposed to be either the same or slightly different called uh, Pedro Preto. So it may be the same as Black Madeira. We have that one and it's making fruit with the right color. So uh, we may just say, okay, we're not selling that one. We'll sell Pedro Preto. It's either the same or it's better. So we'll, we'll go with that. Then Black Ischia <clears throat> is another one that's rated right at the very top. Um, and ours came out in green and brown last year, so we said, okay, we're not selling this one. Um, but that green and brown one was really good. <laughs> so, you know, what do you do with that stuff? So, uh, we got Black Ischia from a customer who told us he got this from the UC Davis collection. So we're, we're pretty sure that's going to be the right one or the one that everybody else is familiar with. So we'll sell that one next year. Now, truthfully, you know, I've eaten a good Pigo Preto. I mean, they're a little better than like Flanders. They're not hugely better. The best fig in the world, I, I would tell you, are probably a little more consistent all year at, at making good quality fruit than some of the others. But uh, not extremely that much better. But there are, again, there's a lot of collectors out there. We're seeing, like last year, some people were buying pieces of stem from Black Ish for Black Issue on the internet for like $300, 400 So people are really, you know, into the getting the very best one. Harry, when you say next year, does that mean fall of 2020? Uh, late spring. We should have enough. I know this this year we start selling you know, plants that were about were about this big uh, around April because uh, you know we can't hide them. So and when we have them at the nursery, we have like 401 gallon plants around the nursery, and people were just picking them up. They said, "I want this." I said, "It's not ready yet, but I want it." So we just told everybody, "Okay." Come and get them. Now <laughs> they're all gone. So. Okay, another one that we really like is uh, Cole de Dom. This is highly rated too. Cole de Dom Noir. Cole de Dom is just a series of figs from France, and they're shaped. Cole de Dom means collar of a lady's dress. 
supposedly. So this is Cold and Dom Noir. And it is quite different because the flesh inside looks like uh, black tar. But this one's not totally ripe. In fact, I think got a little sunburn from being open up. So it's not totally ripe, but when it's riper, it's really black in there. So it looks like it's rotten. But then when you eat it, it's really good. So it is it is one of the more unique figs out there in that it looks really bad. <laughs> like that. I don't I think we're totally sold out. We had a five gallon one out there earlier. But that one's quite good. And then LSU purple, we still have some of these left. No, that was actually developed by Louisiana State to handle their weather down there, hot, humid, wet. So it is more resistant to disease. It's got closed eyes. And that's a pretty good fig too. I'll see purple. We've been growing that one. Um, Excuse me. So are all their leaves the same color green, or do they different colors? Leaves all look alike. Now there's different shaped leaves. So if you grow up, a fig comes up out of the ground from a seed, the leaves are very snowflake-like. So they're they tend to be deeply lobed and deeply cut. So you know that's a seedling when, it, when the leaves look like that. As they get older, the leaves get more rounded. But some varieties, like this Leo Long Neck, they call this a shovel leaf where there's no lobes at all. They tend to do a lot of those. So some figs, you know, like they say Figo Preto and Black Madeira have shovel leaves. Well, if you look on any fig tree, you'll see leaves of all shapes. But this, most of them will be shovel shaped on that one. Still, you'll find leaves there, like maple leaves, and you know, on one plant. So it's it's hard to make IDs exactly from this leaf shape. But we do notice that Black Mission, even though it's a real old variety, tends to have leaves that look like this, real long lobes, same as Violet de Bordeaux tends to be real long, three three fingers. Whereas the uh, it's the Italian, the flat figs tend to have five lobes, more like this, but that's just general. Yeah. Is it normal for the leaves to kind of point up like they're curling up like a cup, like on the Flanders? Is that kind of normal or is that a signal? Well, when they're going upwards, that means they're getting a little dry. A little dry, okay. And if they're drooping, they're a little too wet. That's what we've seen. Yeah. Now this Flanders is in bad dirt, that's probably what's doing that. Are, the roots are on. Can't suck on. You know, they can't pull the water up. So it's probably just from uh, the bad soil work that's in. Okay, I want to see if I have any others here that are worth mentioning. So there is one thing that we sell that. I don't, know, I don't think I have any left right now. Um, it's kind of interesting name, unknown. Pastillary. Uh, so there was a thing out there called Pastillary, and, and a nursery down in San Diego area got some cuttings, and they said, this isn't the right fig. So they named it the unknown Pastillary because it wasn't Pastillary but it had real good fruit, so they kept it. Uh, it is a small, kind of a reddish purple fruit with the, well, I've got my backyard, so it's about that big. It's kind of reddish at the bottom, and it's got green where it attaches to the stem. Reddish purple, real nice flavor. I mean, a real nice red meat, real good flavor, but it is a Smyrna type of fig. So it's got to be wasp pollinated because uh, one way you know is that half the figs don't develop because it wasn't pollinated. So they just turn yellow and fall off the tree. Uh, so we don't get as many figs on this, but it is quite good. So 
I know Pasteur is probably the only big variable cell that needs to be washed more or less. Well, these don't ever get a flower, do they? Flowers inside. Right, so a fig is inside out flower. Figs and mulberries are quite close related. The mulberry's right side out, the fig's inside out. Yeah. Yeah. About most of the good ones. fig that we're growing um, called Cola Dum Ramada. I don't didn't have any this year. A customer gave me some cuttings for growing and it's making figs that are striped just like this but they're a different shape. They're longer. Uh, tiger figs are quite round and this one is longer so it's different and there's one other fig we want to get it's, it's a purple stripe. Purple fig that's got stripes. So there's, there's a lot of neat stuff around. Okay let's switch. That's fig. Now pomegranates, uh, the botanists believe that pomegranates evolved in India. In India, it was not a part of Asia for a long time. It kind of migrated, I think they said from Africa over to Asia and became part of Asia. So they might have, uh, um, now they look totally different than a lot of other fruits from that area of the world. Um, now the center of the pomegranate world is kind of like Turkey. They have the most varieties there. Now in, in the U.S., for 100 years, the most popular fig, uh, excuse me, pomegranate coal is called Wonderful. And it was found or developed in Florida around 1900. And it's been the only one that's ever been grown for a long time commercially. Um, but it is not the top rated fruit. So, it, you know, you know the ones from the store, red skin, ripe in the fall, hard seeds, the red arrows, those berries around the seeds, kind of a tart, sweet flavor. So that's wonderful. Now, in the six, 50s and 60s, people started say, okay, it's time for other pomegranates. So they started looking at the other seedlings coming up and they found some soft seed ones. So in the 80s, the number one seller was Eversweet. The wonderful was the big red one. Eversweet was a small, pale one that ripened in late summer, early fall. This one has colorless arrows, no color in there. And the seeds are large, but they're very soft. So for years, this was the best line because you just peel off the skin and eat the entire inside without having to spit out any seeds. Uh, there was Eversweet, there was Sweet, there was Angel. 
Bill Red came out, which was had red flesh instead of these were both real pale, and Angel Red came out and had more flavor. But then the Russian collection came around. So in Russia, um, Dr. Gregory Levine, Jewish guy, was collecting uh, pomegranates from all over that area. He, he was down there at the Black Sea Caspian Sea area, so real mild climate, kind of like Oregon or Washington. He's collecting uh, pomegranates from all over that part of the world. And in the 1980s, he was calling up all the universities because Russia was splitting up. They lost their funding, their trees are drying up. He called up all the universities and said, you know, would you like me to send you a whole bunch of cuttings to save this collection? So UC Davis got uh, 35, 40 of them. Uh, and they were growing them in the, in the late 80s. They had their first taste off with the American varieties and the Russians took the top seven spots. So Mr. Levine, Dr. Levine had collected a bunch of good ones from that area of the world and they are considered number one. Uh, well, anyway, number one is considered Parfionka. And it's a big red one. Um, the difference being, it's sweeter than Wonderful, it's not quite as tart. Um, the book says if you want to compare anything, you say it's like red wine. It's got some tartness to it, but a lot of sweetness. The seeds are both small and soft, so you hardly even notice there's any seeds in that one. Versus when I was eating Eversweets, it's like you're eating a pomegranate along with bird, um, sunflower seeds because the seeds were large in there. But Parfionka, the seeds are very small. And then right close to it, and sometimes number one is Ariana, which is a little darker red. About the same size, but the darker red. And they said it's kind of between our between Park Dunk and Wonderful as far as tart, a little bit more tart. Some people like them tarter. But Par Ariana is just a hair more tart than the Parfionka. And sometimes this wins over Parfionka, but still it's top rated. Then number three is usually the, the Stars, the Stars Yeah. It's a paler fruit. Um, they describe it as the best lemonade. So we, this for the first time two years ago, I said, well, what does that mean? You know, the customer number is in, okay, the book says it's like the best lemonade. What does that mean? It's a pomegranate. So we ate one, we had some, I had a, one big tree out there, I think. We ate some of the fruit off of that. And it was just sweet and mild until you swallowed it. It does, it does the same thing that lemonade does. It gets you in the throat. It's got that finishing astringency. And we thought, boy, this is the best thing we've ever eaten. And, you know, I hadn't eaten Parco and Ariana yet, but we thought this is really good. And this usually comes up number three on the list. So those those are the top three. Um, dessert in the eye, which means dessert. They describe it as sweeter, more like lemonade. Uh, this is Parfionka here. Fruit's not, well these are, talk more about culture, but we'll do that after the varieties. We'll go through the varieties first. This is dessert me. And that fruit may be close to ripening. I mean, they'll be bigger if they're in the ground. This is still pretty young. Uh, pomegranate's flower from March all the way into August, really, so some of this is started to form. Um, and certainly is usually around number five on the list, so also very, very good. All soft, small, soft seeds in these. And then one other of the conventional ones we do carry is pink satin, which they describe as uh, fruit punch. I haven't eaten pink satin yet. I've eaten dessert in the eye, it's just very sweet. They said it's like orange juice. So, this one you can't spray with, so those are the 
the main ones. Uh, Dave Wolf's nursery, which, which has been growing like 20 varieties for quite a while, has quit growing quite a few of these. So we're going to have to grow some of our own. I think the Sarskii, they've given up on. And the Serenevia, which is another one in the top 10, um, they've stopped growing that because not enough people want it. They all want number one and number two. Um, now there's another one that will sell in the future. I don't know if I have any left. This year, Austin. Austin's a hard seed. But if you want to juice them, you want the hard seed. And Austin's supposed to be the best of the hard seed pomegranates out there. There's a whole book written about it by a farmer in Texas about the Austin. He said this is the best uh, pomegranate he's ever eaten. Now, he's in northern Texas. Northern Texas, you know, it's really strange how North America is. Uh, Northern Texas is too cold for all the Russian ones. They can't handle the cold. They can handle Oregon, you know, Central Oregon weather, but you take them to the center of the United States, they just freeze to death. So they're they're not as cold hardy. Austin is from Syria, but the hard seed ones tend to be able to handle the cold better. So they said in India where they evolved, the ones closer to the northern parts can handle the cold better than the ones further south are more tropical. So we have Austin is supposed to be the best of the hard seeds. Um, I haven't eaten one yet, but they said this is much better than wonderful. According to this Texas farmer, he said this, uh, this is the best pomegranate that they've grown is Austin. So my future Austin crop is right here. <laughs> if we lost the nursery, they introduced it. They went out of business. So you start pomegranates by little cuttings. You, you get stems about this big in winter, you cut them, stick them in a pot of our acid mix. There, I suck about 10 stems in here and about uh, seven or eight are growing. There's a few that didn't make it. So they're pretty easy to propagate. But uh, I have one, no, I don't think I have a single Austin left this year. We sold all the ones we have. I have a mother plant at our growing ground in Austin, so I'll keep that one going. Now there's one other pomegranate that we sell. And no one else has this one that I know of. So this is called Aaron. It was in our newsletter for Reddit. Mm -hmm. So one of my neighbors, former neighbors, was I think he's an importer, he travels around the world. He was eating a pomegranate in Singapore, and he said, oh, this is pretty good. So he brought the seed, it was a soft seed of rice, he brought the seeds back with them, he planted his backyard, and he got this tree. It's evergreen, it flowers all year round, and the fruits all year round, and the fruit are large, they've got light red meats, sweet, soft seeds. <coughs> so there is a, um, dwarf pomegranate that we sell ornamentally that blooms year round and has small fruit. So that's the trop those are tropical pomegranates. So these are from the evolved in the southern part of India. They're tropical. They don't go to sleep unless we have they, they can go to sleep if we have like 25 degrees or colder, they'll just drop their leaves and go to sleep. Otherwise this thing flowers and fruits year round. Now we made this cutting um, about I think last summer we did this in the cutting. And a lot of times if I'll do the cutting and they'll have fruit on them before the end of the year, before the end of the second year. Uh, What's the name of this one? Aaron. 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 So my former neighbors named it after one of the neighborhood girls that was my daughter's best friend. Um, she died all unexpectedly, but so they named this one after her, so. But it's very unique. It's really hard to propagate. That's been the problem, because it doesn't go to sleep. So there's no dormant wood. And uh, you know, if I did 10 cuttings like this, I get maybe one to grow. So we charge a lot for this, because you know, I'm doing like 200 cuttings every year and getting maybe 20 plants out of it. Well, on, on that pot right there, that's gonna be like 10 trees, all growing out of the Yeah, I'll, split, I'll, just, I'll just take this out of the pot and split them into individual trees. 
but we just did them that way, just quicker. Usually I start cutting con separate little containers, but we did that because we didn't have time to do yeah, the other way. Is it just me, or have you done some branching to this? It's all natural, natural branching. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, so it looks just identical to the regular pomegranates. It just flowers and fruits year round, so it's good ornamental edible. Um, now, pomegranates, there is a new bug out there, just so you know, that works in the summertime. So these kind of finish growing in the spring, no problems. This one's still growing. So you see the leaves at the top are all curled up. So Dave Wilsoners told me they, they're pretty certain it's a thrip that's causing this. And it's been around for about five years. I don't know. We don't treat it. It doesn't seem to cause any lasting damage. It just warps the growth as it comes out. It doesn't seem to kill the growth. It just warps it a bit. So we're living with it. You can spray uh, Stenosad on it to control it if you want to spray that. We hit these with the pesticide uh, this week, so it won't be taking home bugs on it. But normally we just let it go. We just say, well, it's there. And it happens during warm weather. Yes. What size tree would start producing fruit? Like how old would the tree be? Or the caliper size would it be? Well the normal pomegranates, you can see they're produce you know this tree when we got it uh, last fall was this big. It was about less than two feet tall. So they can produce immediately. No, pomegranates produce on new growth. So you can, you know, we've had, we've taken cuttings of this that were that big and had fruit on them the same year. So they can produce immediately. Um, the problem is it's got to be sunny when they're blooming. So this year was not one of their best years. So like 2014 was the hot spring. When we It was just 90 degrees all spring. Almost every pomegranate we had what tall had fruit on them, we're just amazed. They're all fruiting at this size. And then the year after that, 2015, really cloudy. We only had, I think we were trying to find the fruit in here. So we only had two trees that next year that had fruit on them, because it was totally clouded over. Now as the trees get bigger and the stems get thicker, they fruit anyway. But when they're young, they're totally dependent on the energy of the sun, it seems, to get their fruit going. So, uh, so yeah. Um, they can fruit really early, but it's got to be sunny now. Aaron, because it flowers year-round, it's more apt to fruit because it's fruiting, I mean, it's flowering during the summer, during the fall. It's going to have warm weather on those flowers. So that one tends to produce the first year no matter what. Flowers that might be associated with sun, not with other things like water or fertilizer as much? Well, you need the water. Yes, I mean, water is important. Fertilizer, that's all if they're blooming, you've got the fertilizer. So if they aren't blooming, because I've got some from you guys like these, and they are not blooming, but they not seem enough. healthy. Yes, uh, just not enough sun that year. Okay. So this year was pretty cloudy year, so you know I would say maybe one quarter of our trees, because we get a lot of trees in, uh, one quarter of our trees had flowers and fruit, the rest of them did not. Gotcha. <clears throat> when the flowers uh, and then fall off, you know, Well, it's going to be the weather and the age of the tree. So the older the tree gets, the more likely it is to make fruit. Uh, the weather, again, and you got to give it enough water. Now, it is true, any pomegranate orchard will have two varieties. So they're not perfectly self-fertile. So most people only have one pomegranate tree and they get enough fruit. But if you want the maximum number of pomegranate fruit and bigger fruit, it's better to have two different kinds around. Are they being in close or fresh? They have to be real close. Very close. Yeah. I have the uh, but the leaves turn yellow on them. Maybe it was the leaves. Well, that could be not enough water, not enough fertilizer. Not enough water will do that to them. This this pot is really too small <coughs> on a hot day to have to support all those leaves, mm -hmm. whereas this one's still okay. Yeah, because the wonderful is that it's about 12 feet now, so pretty well five years old. Needs, well, when I used to grow pomegranates in the 1990s, <coughs> it seems like none of my trees did anything for four or five years. In the fifth year, they started kicking in and got going. Uh, 
now we expect it earlier than that, but uh, and then when I first started growing them, I didn't have any fruit yeah, the first four years on any of my trees. Now we found out, you know, pomegranates are noted in the books that the trees themselves are drought resistant or drought tolerant, but they seem to need a lot of water to fruit and to avoid cracking and splitting. You gotta water them a lot. Um, in our backyard at my last house, we put them in a certain spot, which turned out to be the drainage area of my yard. So one year, when we, it was 98, when we had that, uh, what was it, 35 inches of rain, they were essentially in a pond for four months straight. <coughs> Best crop I ever had. <laughs> so they, they can handle the water. I mean, this was clay dirt, underwater, no problem. They look fine. So too much water didn't hurt them um, at all. When you say close together, how close together? Far? Should be the next plant over. So you know they in the old books they said well bees can go the tree should be within 25 foot, but all the new books say now don't listen to that old stuff. It's, they said the farmers when they're watching like on apple orchards they used to plant row of galas and a row of fujis. But the farmers were saying, we don't see the bees crossing from one row to the next. We see them going down one row. They don't seem to cross that eight feet to the next row. So now they intersperse them in the same row because they said the bees aren't crossing. So what would be the good distance between the two? Oh, I'd have them say within eight foot trunk to trunk so that they can grow together. Now, Hummingbirds seem to like the flowers too. So hummingbirds, they, they travel distance. So if the hummingbirds are doing it, then you probably that you know the distance is not as important. But if the bees are doing it, they gotta be pretty close. Yeah, I would say if you look at this plant, this one was not rooted in the ground at our growing ground. This one was rooted in the ground. So that's yellowness on that's probably lack of water. This was sitting on a, a black tarp, so it couldn't root into anything. This was sitting on the dirt to root in, so that one didn't run out of water. So this is more or less a water issue. So when you prune these in the winter, um, well, the thing you do with pomegranates to train them is not have too many trunks. So when they're young, they tend to do this. Out of the dirt, you get hundreds of little trunks growing. You want to keep cutting those off and keep it. You know, some orchards they say work with one trunk, and some orchards work, work with up to five. No, no, one that said up to eight. But don't let it do 20 or 30 trunks or more, because then we'll get thick enough to develop to support a good crop. So you want to keep them down so you don't have too many. How would you trim them? Just cut? Yeah, just cut. They grow on a new growth. Yeah, they, they fruit on new wood. Since with the air, you know, you can start with a plant this big and it fruits that same year. Of course, that is coming off of one year old growth. I mean, they got so many branches, I don't think you have to worry about one year old, two year old wood that much. There's so many little branches. They are somewhat spiny, the ends of the branches get kind of sharp. Yeah. Um, is it just me, or have you maybe sort of pruned off the top of the, the leader up there? Yeah, I couldn't get this on a, on a, on a cart through the door, so I oh. cut off the top. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions today on the uh, Bug-wise, scale, you get scale on sometimes. Any diseases? Of course, we talked about the thrips. Um, now, if you were going to Eversweet, we had a lot of problems with Eversweet with the fruit rotting, and that's because the flowers were different. So, like on this one, you can see the flower remnants is trumpet-like. On Eversweet, it was really weird. The flower would do this; it would it would be an any, and it would close off. And because of that. They ever sweet off and start rotting in the flower and going through the fruit. So what I started doing on my Eversweets to keep them from doing that, just cut off the flower remnant right after a bloom. 
I, I had um, problems with mealy bugs on the on the form fruit itself, mm -hmm. and I uh, came in and talked to you guys, and uh, ants, of course, were a big part of the problem, and uh, made a mess for a while, but I did get it cleaned up. Yeah, keep those ants off. <laughs> when it's in its fruiting stage, what do you do? Do you like cut off fertilizer, or reduce water, or anything? Or how do you take care of it when it's fruiting? Just keep watering. I mean, in a lot of the orchards, what they do is that as the fruit approaches ripening, they cut off the water. So I think that's kind of dangerous because you know if the area is definitely a dry area, because when you when when the fruit starts drying, it starts shrinking. And if you get a rainstorm, it'll swell up so fast it usually splits open. So you can keep it. I would you know on naval oranges, what their strategy is keep them uniformly wetter than they should be. So that they can't shrink on you because once the navel orange shrinks and it, and it rains on it, it just blows open and you lose your entire crop. Same with pomegranates. Of course, pomegranates, even when they split, they're still edible unless they start rotting there after a while. But uh, um, I'd rather keep them wet than the chance of being dry and then get a rain on them and then they just blow up. So, but a lot of the books say, yeah, you can keep her off the watering as they're ripening, avoid splitting. Well, that's not how you avoid splitting. You keep them, if you keep them really wet, they don't split. Let them get dry, then you're in trouble if it, if it does, if you water too much at one time or if, it's, or if it rains. Yes? I have um, a wonderful, it could be 12, 15, I can't remember when I planted it. A long time ago. <clears throat> and it was pruned beautifully by a professional this past And it's grown beautifully, full of pomegranates, all different sizes. But I'm not, you know, and I just know, I was gone for a few weeks, came back, I just noticed that a few, I mean, it's practically touching the ground. The branches are so heavy. But some of the pomegranates are splitting and others are not quite that red. I'm not sure how to pick. I make jelly. So can you pick them all and just put them in a refrigerator? I mean, how do you keep these so you don't have to do everything the same thing? How do I know which ones are right and which need a few more Pomegranates do keep well on the tree. You can just let them hang. Until they actually split. I mean, eventually okay. they split anyway, because right. that's how the birds, that's how yeah. nature yeah. spreads the seeds. But they'll hold on the tree quite a long time. You just have to pick them and try them. I mean, it's, it's more of a timing thing, although in your case, yeah, they, they can bloom from March all the way into August, so that fruit's going to ripen over a long period of time, too. Uh, they say usually the main crop is the early crop. And the late flowers don't amount to much, but this year, you know, the late this is a real late flower, so that's not going to be ripe. You know, normally uh, Parfianca ripens late September, early October. Well, this isn't close, so uh, we'll just have to wait and see when it, when it ripens. But is it the color of the shell, the peel? Hard to say. I mean, mm -hmm. wonderful normally is dark red, uh -huh. but we see a range of colors on a lot of our trees. So. I haven't grown enough pomegranates to tell you that. Some plants are really good with pomegranates. I haven't grown enough of. It's like on the air, and uh, they can be light red. They can be deep salmon. I would say size would probably be the better indicator. Size. Okay. Yes. I read one source that said if you if you sort of tap the pomegranate and there's a metallic sound to it, that it might be right. <laughs> Haven't tried that in real life. Uh, my other comment was, if the fruit splits, is it pretty much you got to take it off? Or no, they, they can hold for weeks, split as long as they don't get moldy in there. They're still actually pretty good. Okay. A lot of times they'll split in the nursery, and we'll just leave them on the tree, and then we'll just walk by and eat some. As long as the bugs don't find it, that's 
Um, two to grow versus one to grow. You said two is better than one in growing. Right. Well, yeah, if you want more, the most fruit possible, get two different kinds. Okay. So, uh, all the orchards do that, at least two different kinds. And then, bush like or tree style better for the fruiting? Well, most of the orchards, the trees look the same. Most of the pictures we see of orchards, they kind of look like that. Okay. Um, you know, just kind of a mushroom shape, I guess you'd say. <clears throat> this is huge. If you go out, drive around up in the Fresno area, you'll see all of the pomegranate uh, trees, shrubs, whatever you want to call it, but you know, they're, they all look like a big shrub. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, which two that you carry today would you recommend planting together? Well, uh, you might as well get number one. I mean, Parfianca is certainly our best seller. Whatever one else you want. You want something totally different, you can get pink satin, which is totally mild flavored. Parfianca is a little bit on the slight, just slightly tart. We don't, we only have one wonderful out there. We don't really push the wonderful. We carry all the other ones out there. Would Aaron be an, a contender for the second? Yeah. Um, it's totally different. I mean, there's nothing that really pollinates it since it blooms year round. Well, that's not true. The other pomegranates bloom close to half the year, so Aaron uh, will get pollinated by that, but it's usually by itself. And my neighbor's tree has never been pollinated by any other pomegranate, they just have their one tree. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Why did you switch? Mm -hmm. oh, 